Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, so as you can see from our, our panel title, we are talking about uh, killer apps and conflicting law. Um, the killer apps we're talking about in particular are innovative music services. And we're going to get to the point where we can talk about the legalities and the innovative um, things that people have done uh, at, at Omid's company and at Chris's company to, and at other companies to deal with the, the um, complicated copyright system and the requirements of licensing. But before we uh, get there, we have to do a little bit of, of music copyright or a little bit of copyright basics just to get everyone oriented. And in a way, for those of you who were here yesterday, we are going to be picking up with some of the themes from the blanket licensing panel that, that closed the day yesterday. Um, so Jessica, I'll ask you first. Um, talk to us a little bit about the two kinds of music copyright and the differences between the licenses required, say, for selling exact copies versus making a remix. Okay, you have in uh, any recording of music two copyrights. One of them is the copyright in the musical composition uh, owned either by the songwriter or by the music publisher. The other is the copyright in the performance and recording, usually owned by the label. In order to make use of that musical work as recorded in that recording, you need licenses from both of those copyright owners. And in addition, the copyright statute divides up rights into reproduction, adaptation, public performance, distribution to the public, public display. The way the music, com the music industry has structured itself over the years, it's uh, very likely that different entities will be controlling who licenses those rights. So yesterday we heard about some of the blanket licenses and statutory licenses, and the point the panel made is that they're very narrow. They only cover particular uses, uh, 20th century uses, all of them. Uh, so whenever you are making use of a work outside of those licenses, it may be necessary to negotiate specific licenses uh, with many entities. Uh, and sampling, for example, uh, or remix are some things that you can't get a statutory license for. You actually have to figure out a way uh, to get a specific license to do what you're doing, and that can be very expensive. Thanks, that's perfect. So that gets us oriented. Now, Dean, I was going to ask you bring you in here to say, some in the audience might be wondering why. So why have that system? Is there what, what are the what's the let's give a I mean what are the rationales behind that system? How did it get that way? The idea is that the arts generally will be regenerative, and so you want to have a licensing scheme that allows use and promotion of the useful arts, including including music. Uh, the publishing rights came first, uh, and then later, uh, significantly later. Uh, the owners of sound recording rights thought that they needed a right as well uh, for public performance of those sound recordings and so negotiated those as a result uh, and one of the things I do a lot of today is negotiate with Congress whenever you have legislation that outlines uh, division of rights it's often a messy process and so hence the lack of uh, complete symmetry between the rights that, that exist for the sound recording and the rights that exist on the publishing side. And the need for different licensing, as the professor pointed out. Great, thanks. Um, Jessica, did you want to weigh in on that question too a little bit? No. <laughs> um, the, um, so we have this set up, the, the rights allocated to different parties. We've got the publishing rights, we've got the sound recording rights. Um, now we're going to bring in sort of what, you know, every time there is a new technology, we have a, pr a problem. We have questions about how that uh, system is going to, how the copyright system is going to apply to those services. And so I thought the the best thing would be to start um, with Omid here and talk about talk about what your what your service does. What are you how are you trying to use music, and and just explain explain what your service does. What is legit mix? Sure. Well, I was introduced to uh, the whole problem facing remix artists through uh, my best friend and uh, and colleague Booker Sim, who's here in the audience with me. Uh, he uh, failed to get the music licensing for a uh, documentary he spent four years putting together, and, and uh, I really just thought that was, that was horrible. So I started thinking about the problem, and uh, I said, well, the problem with, with sample-based music remixes is that 
the remixer, the DJ, the producer's value added is glued in with the copyrighted music. So I said, well, what if it's possible to separate their value added from the copyrighted music? What if it's possible to create instructions which they can give or sell to a fan so the fan could then recreate their work using their copy of the copyrighted music? So in, in essence, it takes the, the burden off the remixer by enabling the consumer to recreate the remixer's work using their purchased copies of the, co of the, uh, of the music. And, and that's the, the basis of, uh, of Legitmix. Excellent. And Chris, why don't you, I don't know, people might not be familiar with your company. Um, <laughs> so the, maybe you should explain what YouTube that was, does. That was the nice thing about moving from systems engineering to YouTube is I, I no longer have to explain it. So well, well and particularly, like, sorry, I'm yeah. sorry, joking aside. But with respect to music. Oh, no one laughed, so yeah. to call that a joke is yeah. a bit generous. Um, <laughs> the, um, inside. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, how does YouTube interact with music in yeah, particular, yeah. and why so, is that such an issue? So if you, there's a couple, there's many different ways that YouTube interacts with music. I think the most, um, the easiest one to wrap our heads around um, is the evolution of what were the music videos on television, right? So we're now a platform where what you would have watched on MTV 20 years ago, you can go and watch on YouTube. But I think the more interesting um, aspect of YouTube, and probably the part that uh, is relevant here, is we're also a platform for user-generated content. So YouTube was started so that people could share their own personal videos and as an outlet for their creativity. And one of the, one of the sort of cornerstones of, of a good video product is integrating it with music and, and making a creative video with music. And so we spend a lot of time at our service going out and working with copyright holders to license content so that people who aren't familiar with the law or the framework that they're working in, when they create a really creative video and put it on the site um, are able to keep it on that site and that the people who own the copyrights get paid. Great. Now, Larissa, I think it's time to bring you in here. You have an interesting perspective as both an academic and a DJ. Can you talk to us first about sort of how these services relate to what DJs do and, um, and also then about how, lis how the listeners and the fans sort of consume these things? Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, I'm really glad to be here, uh, especially because looking at the panel, uh, I mean, at the title, there's nothing about people, creativity, or communities on there, which I guess we can just assume are part of the story, but so far they haven't actually really, like, there's not that much there. And so, because one of the things that's interesting about the idea, the argument for licensing is uh, people say, you can't do this unless you have a license. But coming from someone who is a DJ and who studies creative people, everybody does it all the time. I mean, that's the rule, not the exception. That's what communities do. And certainly copyright, as it looks now, is very different than it used to be. And it hasn't always been everywhere all the time. And so for the majority of creative history in the world, in America, everywhere, people did all this stuff all the time. So then the question of what the advantage of this is is very different. <laughs> like what the advantage of having licensing is is very different if you assume people didn't ask permission before, right? <laughs> that, then it's a different question. Like the advantage for corporations or for lawyers is clear, <laughs> but the advantage for artists to me is not necessarily clear if artists were already doing this. So that's kind of the baseline that I start with. Um, and within that, what DJs do, for those of you who aren't familiar, is uh, take existing music and combine it in various ways uh, in order to have an interactive experience with an audience. Uh, and that involves being able to draw on music that people may be familiar with and that they're not familiar with. And part of the art of it is the way that you combine it to make a sort of narrative uh, emotional experience. Uh, so um, with that respect, again, to the extent that DJs uh, find themselves constrained by licensing uh, these seem like something that would be worth investigating to DJs. Um, again, I think the question is, who are those ones that are constrained in this way? Um, and the same with communities. Which are the ones that are constrained? Uh, and um, will this help them the way it's supposed to help them uh, or not? Um, that would be right. No, and I think, I think the idea of... Um that's right, it's left implicit when we say conflicting law. What are we conflicting with? We're conflicting with creativity, I think, and I think that's right. And we're conflicting maybe with the norms of communities that have existed. I think that's a fair point. Um, so, Omid, I want to get back to you and ask, sort of, given um, how your service works, given how people want to use it, 
um, what legal, what's the legal problem when you, you know, when you had the first conversation with the, with the lawyers, <laughs> you know, what's the legal, pro what's the legal problem that they told you you face with this service or what, what are the, how do, how do you want to think about the hurdles? Legally. Well, the, the problem that we went out to, uh, to solve is, is the remixers problem of licensing music. Like, uh, as you were saying that you have to be a, a very well financed artist to be able to, to, uh, sell your sample based work and that limits. Uh, remixers' ability to monetize their work, and so what Legitmix does is just uh, a, a, a alleviate that problem by uh, making use of the consumer's purchase copy of the music. So, uh, when we presented this to lawyers and and so on, they said, "Well, uh, there's uh, they didn't see a problem with it because the the consumer is essentially uh, remixing the, the music that they own, and so therefore uh, everyone's getting paid." Is the they uh, through the purchase of that original music, right? And so the idea would be you're 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 actually potentially stoking purchases of music, right? If someone wants to fill in the missing pieces of a remix puzzle, exactly. then they might be encouraged to buy. That's part yeah, of the that, idea. That's a great point. Like uh, we've been very open about our technology and met with uh, I've met with three of the four major labels and and the, uh, one of them, uh, the guy who uh, runs all their back catalog said, well, wow, this is really neat because it could turn every DJ into a salesperson for my back catalog. Because that's the, the magic of the DJs is, is that they pull music that uh, from the past, update it, manipulate it for current use, and then make it popular again. And, uh, and in this way, as you mentioned, a legit mix would generate sales of that, uh, of that uh, old track. Yeah, so there's a lot there. Now, um, Larissa, go ahead and jump in. I have a question. Yeah. If the DJ is a salesperson for the back paddle catalog, why do they have to pay in order to be a salesperson? Should mm -hmm. they get paid? Well, they can, and that's a neat thing. So with Legitmix, they could monetize their instructions to recreate the remix. So but they have to pay for Legitmix? Or no. Oh, they don't, they don't no. have to pay for the licenses themselves? No, but the consumer is paid for I the see. original, right? Okay. So uh, the, uh, the the remix artist prices their Legitmix file, whatever they want, and then the consumer buys that. And our software will check the consumer's computer to see if they have the original track. If they don't, they could buy it from us or iTunes, and then they download it and recreate the remix. So it's a, it's a way that the remixer could finally make money through the sale of, of, uh, of their work through the sale of their legit mix file. So Jessica and Dean, we need you to weigh in here. So from a, you guys have no, you know, the, you, from, a, from a neutral perspective, Je Jessica, we'll start with you. What do you think when you think about Omid's argument and legit mix's argument that the service complies with copyright law. How, how would you walk us through evaluating it even? About, you know, what, okay. what, what go, what's uh, going through your head is what I want, to get. I want everyone to know how, you, how you're thinking about the legality of this. Uh, this is going out to everyone in the world. Um, <laughs> so obviously, Oh, not, for, not as counsel. No, 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 you're not on the record that way. No, in, no, no. in 1998 or 1995 or 1976, Congress didn't have Legitmix or indeed YouTube in mind. If you are a record label who doesn't like Legitmix, then the argument you are going to make is, look, you are uh, creating a derivative work or uh, helping consumers to create a derivative work. And just because they're consumers doesn't mean they get a free pass because there's nothing in the copyright statute that says that any personal use is okay. Um, the argument on the other side is, look, Congress never intended to make a law which required everyone listening to and enjoying music uh, to have to call a copyright lawyer uh, to make it okay to make a mixtape or to play something on the piano while watching something on TV. And the problem for a company like Legitmix or uh, YouTube or anyone else is it's not as if, if you call up the label and say, so uh, this is our idea, are you cool with this? They're going to say, oh yeah, fine, great, super. Um, you sort of have to behave as if your business plan is legal and see what happens. Uh, this is why we make insurance. It's somewhat <laughs> risky. 
It may be that someone will call you up and you'll uh, be able to reach a great licensing deal, uh, or it may be someone will sue you and you'll prevail, or it may be that someone will sue you and uh, you won't prevail, but that turns out to be much less trouble than trying to get Congress to figure out if your business plan ought to be uh, something that the copyright says is either, yeah, go ahead, do it, don't worry about it, or go ahead and do it, but make sure you pay the following folks uh, some amount of money when you do it. Yeah, I, Dean, I, why, why don't we get you to weigh in here? Yeah, yeah I agree with Professor Lidman on all of the related legal issues. The, the, and I think the approach that you've taken of trying to get past the legal issues so people who enjoy music can do so without having to worry about that, while also reaching out to the record labels to get ahead of that insurance is the best approach. And so the iPhone 5 may or may not be released today, but the breakthrough with the iPhone is that more and more you're looking and appreciating the design element and the ease of use and not worried about all of the chips and stuff that goes into a phone, right? And so I think the, the great thing about your concept is for music and a DJ and someone who's interested in remixing, you're focused on the music. And so if you want to engage in sampling and remixing, you remove some of the barriers so that those who want to engage in it can without having to worry about the legal nuances of what the implications of Grokster are for YouTube or, or for your service. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's fair to say that the, it, it is, it is an in, to a copyright lawyer, to my mind, there is this interesting thing that the consumers have certainly acquired copies of, you know, if they've acquired copies of the work, they have, cert they have rights to do certain things. And it's a little nebulous, but there is this derivative works right, right. that's a little, we don't, you know, the, the, it, when you acquire music, it isn't clear whether you acquire a right to make derivative works of it or which, in which context, right? It's in this kind of gray area. I think or is that's, it just a license? Well, I'm or, sorry, what? Or is it just a license? Or is it just, or is it just a license, as right. the courts are struggling with today? Yeah, so it brings up interesting issues, but I think, yeah, I think so. But I think that that, um, but everyone should understand that Legitmix has thought, has a, um, you know, there's two sides to the, the, the argument, but that Legitmix has, has sort of pursued this idea, okay, what can we do to behave responsibly, and do we have a plausible argument, right? That was the, the com you needed to achieve a certain comfort level, yeah, right? We, did, uh, we, we worked with a lot of copyright lawyers before uh, uh, getting involved with this. We have some, uh, some very senior people who've invested in the company, so the, the guys who invented the optical switch are on board, so they, like, we're not pirates. Like, we spent a lot of time to, to see, does this achieve the right balance, and, and it, is it, does it fit uh, the law? And, uh, and the lawyers on this panel could talk about all the mm -hmm. cases where this balance between the copyright holder and society has been tested. Uh, Galoob versus Nintendo, uh, iPhone hacking, uh, are all examples where there was this battle between copyright holders and, and the, the individual, but every time the courts and society has always drawn the line at the for, at, uh, at an individual's house that, that, that they have essentially uh, can do what they want inside their home, and so we that to me that just made common sense and gave me a lot of sort of uh, feeling that we're doing the right thing by allowing remixers to to make uh, profit, make, generating sales of of music, and advancing the arts, which I think that's the definition of copyright. So I want to get Chris in here. Yeah, let's talk about. The, the licensing landscape or whatever, that's such a nice, it makes it yeah, sound like a nice word, like it's a pretty thing. <laughs> we look at the licensing so, landscape. so pretty out there. <laughs> uh, pretty, all the, lots of countries, yeah. there's lots of places to see. Yeah, lots, lots of, of places to go. Um, so let's talk about collecting the, societies to meet. Let's so, talk yeah. about the licensing hurdles that you guys face. So I think the, the biggest hurdles we face are always that our users' creativity sort of outstrips whatever the current state of the understanding of the law is. Um, and then, our approach to how we are able to keep music on the site and sort of become an outlet for creativity is that we have to make money around it for the people who own the content. Um, and so if, if you rewind to when I started at YouTube in 2007, we were just sort of tackling the problem of making money for the major record labels in a sort of long-term ecosystem sustainable kind of way because they're the ones there with the DMCA notices, you know, they're the ones in your face and you say you have to prioritize and you say, okay, 
if we don't take care of this constituency, right, it, it's not going to go well, right? And so at that point in time and since then, we've been in, in business with all the four major record labels in the US and then we've grown our collecting society agreements. We have to deal with the dual copyright as well. So for a typical video on YouTube, for example, the, the JK Wedding Dance uh, entrance video or any other number of videos with music, even just a single song, we're usually paying out to probably around a, a couple dozen people around the world who strangely enough are probably representing maybe three or four people. Um, and so, so we've taken the approach that to make this work, we start at the top and then we work our way um, down and simultaneously we start at the bottom and for people who aren't represented by labels and who aren't represented by collecting societies, we find a way for them to get value out of the platform directly. And so we've taken this two-pronged approach and that, that's been our approach is to say, these are the realities of the law. We, we know we need copyright license. We know we need to compensate sound recording um, license holders. We know we have to take care of the compositions that are in works. And then for these different kinds of videos on the site, how do we do that? And so, uh, I'm going to keep going, but one of the things we do is build a content fingerprinting system to tackle this problem. Yeah, right, we should talk a little bit about content ID. Yeah. So we were at a point where um, we were having almost eight days of video uploaded to the site, or I'm sorry, eight years of video uploaded to the site every day. So it's 48 hours of video every minute. And it's not feasible to sit back and say to a record label, oh, just let us know which videos it's in, right? You know, so. Um, we invested in building a system that lets us take a sound recording and then find a copy of that in a user video. And that system has claimed more than 100 million videos on our site. And then from those claims, we allow the people who own those copyrights to make a decision and they can choose to track the content. If they don't want to put ads on it, they can choose to monetize the content, at which point we'll start putting ads on it, or they can choose to block it. And we make the system available to all content owners, so you don't need to be a licensor. A li you don't need to be licensing content to YouTube to make advan to use the system. And this has allowed us to scale, right? This, so this is how we've dealt with the how do we deal with um, two days of video every minute being uploaded to the site, uh, and you know some of those videos are going to go on to get hundreds of millions of views, and some of those videos are going to get. And people have copyright owners have the right to opt out of the system, right? They can, they can, they can to opt use, out altogether. Yeah, they can um, continue to exercise their rights under uh, this law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and say, we want you, we, we know that when yeah. you find our stuff on your site, you gotta take it down. Yeah, in fact, if, if you send us a DMCA takedown notice, you can be not participating in the system at all and we'll take it down. So, um, We've come a long way, by the way. Yeah, let, reactions, Dean, go well, ahead, I mean, expand on that. So I, I, as I shared at the beginning, I worked in both the music and the movie industry and <laughs> have been at various points on different sides of the ledger in litigation with, with YouTube. At one point, uh, worked at, at the music industry and so represented Viacom. And now, Google is one of our members and by extension, YouTube is as well. <laughs> and in the early days when the technology wasn't there, the point you made about trying to scale was very difficult. And so it was a really challenging process because you were doing a lot of this by phone call and paper. And as soon as you called, there were 48 hours of video up again. And so the advancement in technology has is, is eased some of the, the angst. Uh, the other thing that's happened is in addition to technology improving and sites like YouTube and Legitmix really thinking through the, the legal issues, I think the recording industry in particular back then was a, an industry in hemorrhage. You know? And so if you go into, the, into a hospital with multiple gunshot wounds, you're not necessarily thinking about strategically, you know, you're just thinking survival. Uh, and so there was a certain disconnect between the technology and the advancements that were taking place and people's instinct to try to figure out how do they adapt and evolve. Uh, I think over the years there is now a recognition of you know, the, the number of CDs that we used to sell is in, or whatever fixed form since platinum is coming back uh, is never going to come back and so how do we adapt and evolve and take and leverage the technologies that exist today and I just see a greater willingness to, to engage in creative licensing to make sure that occurs. Uh, Jessica, how do you react to both the, the landscape that Chris's company faces, but also the, the solution? How, how do you put this in context for us? So here's the problem. 
Um, yesterday when we talked about a statutory license, one of the great things about that particular narrow statutory license is it requires a portion of the money to be paid directly to musicians. And if you can get Congress to enact a license, it can put that kind of conditions on the statutory license. Because we're so far behind technology, and because it takes Congress so long to do anything, all of these arrangements are being done by negotiation. The labels are agreeing with uh, the folks with new technology and great uses what they're willing to license and on what terms. But for the most part, the individual musicians are rarely at that table. The labels have a powerful economic incentive to structure the deal so that the royalties they end up paying on the revenues they get from innovative new users are as low as possible. Uh, one can't really expect Google to say, oh, I'll make a deal with you, EMI, but you've got to look out for your performers. That's not their job. But in the absence of, of musicians' collective action, it's entirely possible that all these uses will be monetized and the amount of money in performers' pockets will be negligible. And that's what worries me. Larissa, how, um, <coughs> I think this is where, we, we ask questions about how these licensing structures that we're layering on top of a very complicated system. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the the world and the power relationships are getting recreated in some way or changed, or do you feel, or, or, or I'm sorry, re recreated, re replicated, or are they being changed? Yeah, I I don't see mm -hmm. this as particularly solving any of the problems around uh, that face creative communities and artists that don't have power in the current system or in the past. I see this as solving an administrative problem between entities that already have power. And so um, to the extent that, um, so I make a mix uh, that has 45 songs on it. Uh, I'm hoping that a lot of the people who hear that mix haven't heard that music before. Uh, I'm trying to represent artists that people haven't heard for that reason. I like to play things people haven't heard so they can check it out and be excited. That's already happening. Uh, from what I can understand, the cost of a mix that has 45 songs on it that somebody doesn't already own is going to be a lot, and it's not going to reach the people that, uh, that I want it to reach. Uh, I also think that um, the free circulation of that contributes to creativity. I think the source of most of musical innovation comes from places outside of the system. And so I don't see the advantage to inviting people into the system if structural guarantees aren't there, that they have representation and the power to negotiate. And historically speaking, and not just with copyright, it's never been true that if you design a system in which you say, oh, everyone will just negotiate, and then the weak people get represent, like they don't get representation. I mean, that's not how it works in labor law. That's not how it works in any other system. Uh, if you don't build in that the people you most want to nurture and support are actively represented with real power, they aren't going to magically get it somewhere. It's just not going to happen. So for me, that's, that's, I, I feel like uh, these, are, these are interesting, but I don't see the thing that will help people participate in a way that actually helps them. I and, see people pa participating. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. And you don't think that the wide range of outlets for distributing content today is helped in that process? Because I, you, you, I mean, 20 years ago, your choice to really have distribution was to go to one of the major record labels or one of the major movie studios or not. I mean, it seems to me that today, well, the, I mean, the medium for distribution is, whether you make money or not is a whole different story, but at least the means for distribution is so much more democratic. There's two things in there. And so one is, I would say, to the extent that the means of distribution do not filter out the very communities that um, th filter out all the communities um, who are marginalized already, which tend to be the communities that do not, whose practices do not fit with, for example, copyright law, uh, if all of those platforms that are so wonderful are structurally uh, unequal in the same way that the system was before, I don't see necessarily that that's a good thing. And I also think it isn't true that before you're only, I mean, I guess it is true that your only chance was to sign with a major label or not. But not being signed to a major label 
is not necessarily the kiss of death if you're connected to a creative community that has other mechanisms of support. So part of what my research is about is studying creative communities like that and how they work outside that system. And I think we could actually learn from those communities a lot more uh, rather than try to replicate um, the, the system, part of the system that I think has worked very well for major labels but hasn't necessarily worked for these communities. I think a really good thing about all these licenses is they let people uh, who are at home making their remixes, which may or may not be legal, make them available to the world. That's good. People uh, get to see them. That's good. Uh, Larissa and other GJs do their thing. And because there's money flowing, no one is suing uh, those folks for engaging in what may or may not be legitimate uh, as, as a matter of copyright law. And all of those are great improvements over a situation in which if you post a remix video, uh, someone comes after you and, and you have to go find a lawyer. All I want to, to make clear is just because someone is paying to use content doesn't mean that the money is going uh, where we feel it ought to go. Yeah, can I? yeah let's, I wanted yeah. to expand on that point about what flexibility these services give to creators. Yeah. But go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, it's interesting. I think for musicians starting today, there's actually a much brighter future for musicians who started 10 years ago whose, whose copyrights are tied up in, in these systems and with these stakeholders, right? So, and if you look at YouTube today, we have 20,000 partners, right? And there's not 20,000 major labels. Um, and we have hundreds of partners making more than $100,000 a year in, in direct partnership with us. And so, for me, I think the, um, and for YouTube, rather, this is the sort of creativity that we want to encourage. and. If you look at musicians who start on YouTube and who understand the YouTube audience as a creative community, they are able to make an, a, a comfortable middle class living just through publishing their works on YouTube because they're not tied up in saying, like, how, do I make, how do I get CD distribution? Right? They find out what their niche is and then they, they produce for that niche and they, and they build fans and we give them huge reach that they never would have gotten um, in the old system that existed. So I, I do think that the way the platforms are evolving is going to give and is giving more of a voice to these, these niche creators that are doing art that wouldn't happen within the mainstream. So, Yeah, yeah. and um, Omid, I, I think that's a great point. I, Omid, I, I wanted to bring you back in and sort of talk about, so let's contrast. When someone is a DJ trying to license a remix, say you're an independent DJ outside of the system, um, You've got a, you know, you, you've, sa you've created a collage with 20 samples in it. Uh, it's 40 licenses <laughs> at a minimum because we've got the two copyright system. Um, that potentially presents a barrier in the studio, right? Like the, DJ, the DJs have to sort of think, okay, how much are those going to cost? How can I do that? Or they're not thinking about it at all, but then maybe uh, get bitten on the back end. Con the idea is to, con your service is to sort of change that experience, right? Well, in a sense that the DJs are not sort of the uh, policing that might happen in the studio, the self-censoring, the worrying about copyright. You're hoping that DJs don't have to do that. Is that Well, not entirely. Thing? Like, no technology is perfect. Yeah. So, like, we saw a problem and we did our best to find a, a solution. And it doesn't address everything, neither does YouTube. No, no solution is perfect. So coming, coming to the example of, of, a, of a song that samples from 100 tracks, well, that might not be an economically viable thing to sell. No, there might be uh, consumers who'd want to buy Girls Talk album and get all 400 original songs along with it. That, that might, there might be a market out there for it. But it's a tool, and it creates opportunity for original content holders and remixers. Like we've, The projects we've launched, the uh, remixers that like we've worked with uh, Diplo, we're working with Fool's Gold, these people just can't sell their work. Uh, because it's, it, uh, and coming back to scale, these works just can't scale because the labels can't even pick up the phone because it's not worth it to them. If, like, if a project is not going to sell 30,000 albums, it's not worth picking up the phone for. So there's a whole class of people where this technology can now have some benefit for. So it's, the technology is not, uh, is not, uh, can't solve all problems, but uh, and a lot of different people working to solve different aspects, and, 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 we're, and uh, that's what we set out to do. Well, and Chris, would it be fair to say you, you're trying to make, you know, you're, you're trying to get the users to post their content 
do yeah. what they're going to do, and then you're going to deal with the legalities on the back end, right? That's sort of the, the, you know, which is what, in a way, you can almost draw this parallel, right, between of the voluntary licenses that you guys have negotiated in the system you've set up privately with the effect of a compulsory license in just this one way. There's the contrast that Jessica talked about, mm -hmm. but the, the, the thing with when you have the benefit of a compulsory license or you have the benefit of a licensing system in place, part of the idea, right, is that the users just sort of do their thing and then the, st the, the money is worked out on the back. Yeah, yeah, there is no compulsory license we can rely on. So right, of course. Dozens of people all over the world trying to solve this problem, but, but you're trying to we're trying to enable defense. as much creativity as possible and you don't do that by, um, by the method. Negotiating the licenses Negotiating up front for what, yeah. Tens of millions of users negotiating. Right, right, so the, the people with the JK wedding, you're trying to avoid the situation where they have to call Chris Brown's people ahead of time and say, oh, so we're going to do this at our and they're going to dance and it's going to be, yeah, so <laughs> that, that you're going to try to, you're trying to save people the trouble of having that conversation, which would have been, an, you know, a difficult one to they even have because they wouldn't Brown. pick up the phone. Go ahead, Dean. No, I was just going to say they may enjoy calling Chris Brown. If I can say something that's <laughs> pro the man, sure. um, which I guess is embodied by me today. Um, <laughs> the, uh, that's the, not true, Dean. You're just, you're, you're, the, well. It's interesting, though, actually, given my background, but uh, I like it. So the... One thing that's interesting uh, along the creativity point is that there's a, in some senses, a symbiotic relationship that's developed over, over the last few years where the industry is learning and evolving in a way that's reflective of some of the democracy that's taking place. Both one of the m more successful record labels right now is actually Hollywood Records, Disney, uh, and they are able to do a lot of stuff because they have the Disney Channel and otherwise, but they also find artists through very democratic processes. You know, they have this thing called the next big thing where you basically send in a YouTube tape and they select people and their audience select people. Um, similarly, it's rare for an artist to release an album today without having a hundred of some sort of remix tape uh, that they're selling on the street before the album launches. And so there's this exchange that's going on that I think is in some respects, healthy for the established entities, but also very healthy for creativity and, and the arts. One issue, not to get too far in the weeds, but one issue that's sort of complicated for YouTube setup, I think, and dealing with sampling is how to slice up the pie, right? So let's, so you know, you've got a video that contains, a, let's say, more than one sample. Let's say we'll just go to two or three, right? And let's say you know youtube wants to be able to run ads along the side and generate revenue how do how do we think about working out the problem of who gets how much out of that pie right that's a, that's a difficult problem when things are negotiated up front how do how do you guys deal with it on the back end we have a very general framework um, i can talk about it for sound recordings and then also for compositions sure when there's more than one sound recording owner in a video we we divide the revenue right and we don't we don't pretend to say there's 37 seconds of this and 48 seconds of this, and that's not we just We have a framework for dividing. It's pretty simple. It's simple division. On the composition side, of course, there's splits already that's well known and established, and there we just rely on the splits. Um, and when there's multiple compositions, then we can do the same sort of division. So, but again, we're taking the position that we, we have the site and people come forward, they can either take it down. If, if one of those split owners is unhappy with the video, they have every, every ability to take that down. Um, and, and this comes back to also how do we how do we then communicate this to users, right? Because if this is complicated for musicians, the fans of musicians are in, a, in an almost impossible place, right? And so we've built tools to make it easier for people who are tired of getting caught up in this mess. So we have a tool called AudioSwap where we can go out and get pre-licensed um, sound recordings and pre-licensed compositions that are safe for use in any UGC. And so I, when, I, when you say that we want to take the complexity away from the user, this is sort of the, the pinnacle of that. We built a product to do that so they can upload their video and then mix in the audio with pre-approved tracks. But in the cases where that hasn't happened, we're just dividing up the, the revenue among the different owners. Great, thanks. I, I think um, we'll get to questions in a minute. I wondered if the panel, uh, so we've got to this place where we've, we've seen these innovative private licensing solutions. I wonder if, if, if each of you maybe could give your thoughts about how we make copyright policy. Is it a better system to let Omid innovate and let Chris's company innovate? And 
work out some kind of private system and come up with the, the innovation that fits their service? Or is it better to be thinking about a legislative process? Or is it better to have a, have a pretty general statute and have the courts settle which services are, are, are really, I mean, we have a mix of all these things, you know, and I'm wondering sort of process-wise, what, what, what does this make you think about the, the way that we got here? You know, and I think this brings in some of Larissa's concerns as well. Uh, so if, if, I mean, if you want to start and then we'll go to. Well, these are all experiments, like what YouTube's doing, what, what we're doing is, is our, uh, our testing out solutions to a very complex problem and, uh, and there'll be a lot of things that will come and go and eventually that will affect maybe even legislative change. But just to, to impose uh, legislation on a very complex thing where a lot of people are involved is, is difficult. So I, I think this is the, the way forward to, to try different uh, solutions and, and see how they stick. Lisa, what do you think? Um, a lot of things. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> two, two things. One is um, I, I agree that there should, I'm excited about lots of experiments. Uh, but I, I think, and I'm, I'm probably not showing my hand here too much, <laughs> that uh, we're in a massively unequal system. Uh, we always, we have been. <laughs> uh, and it's massively unequal in lots of ways that disadvantage particular communities, particular regions of the world, particular sets of practices, particular identities. And so, the idea that experiments will lead to the naturally best one rising to the top in an unequal system is, is, is unconvincing because I tend to think that uh, experiments that support the existing system rise to the top. So, so all things being equal, I don't think it's enough to have experiments. Uh, I th and I'm very concerned about how we look at um, the ways that people who are currently marginalized have survived so far, what works for them, and if there's anything that can be done to foster those things uh, in relation to the current system. Uh, and so that means being very wary of what it means to invite people to participate without recognizing how you define the terms of that participation, if this doesn't sound too uh, heady. But what I mean is um, if people's practices don't fit are we going to ask them to change their practices? Are we going to ask them uh, to pay for things they didn't used to pay for? I mean, a lot of the, the simplifying that's going on, it used to be very simple because people didn't ask for permission, right? I mean, none of this was necessary until you started tracking what people were doing. And so, to some extent, the idea that if we just track everything as perfectly as possible, it will be just like not being tracked at all, to me, I'm a little worried about because a lot of the great things that came out of music came out of not being tracked at all. Uh, and so part of what I'm interested in, because I am in a policy program, is thinking about ways that policy can carve out spaces where people are not tracked and can do what they do outside of um, being monitored in this way. Uh, and uh, I don't have, I have some specific policy solutions that I talk about in other places, but I think that's always my concern, is that it's not automatically liberating to participate in a system that monitors your every move uh, if you don't have strong ways to speak back uh, or to defend yourself. And so, for example, um, although I really uh, love YouTube and use it and do all those things, um, you know, it used to be that you had um, practices that could not be monetized. <laughs> and so just the idea that monetizing them is automatically liberating, I find a little not necessarily appealing. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that people didn't used to need licenses for. So the fact that we can license them isn't also automatically a win. Uh, so, and the idea that, you know, what are, the, what are the methods by which YouTube evaluates the validity of a copyright claim? Uh, what are the methods by, by which people can, can argue back against a copyright owner and say, no, this is allowed, right? Those are the places where I want to see, like, you know, space for people to sort of carve out practices where they don't have to ask permission or, or have someone else sort of monitor their behavior. So I'll stop there. Chris, why don't we let you jump in since that, a lot of those comments were directed at well, YouTube. Well, just as an example. Not, not, in a, not in a bad way, but just so that you get a chance to, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll think, go out um, of order here. We're, we're keenly interested in tracking um, the use of copyright on the site, and then we're, because we want to pay for it, and because we can't generate money unless we can pay for it, and because the content won't in the long term continue to be produced unless it's getting paid for. Um, and so I, I recognize people have been singing long before they were paid for mm -hmm. music, but in the, the ecosystem and the, the reality that we're, that we're working with, we realize that it's essential that people get paid for that. And so that's... They don't always get paid through royalties. There are other ways people get paid. Right? Agreed, agreed. So, so it may not have to be your job to do that either. <laughs> that so, would not be nice. Yeah, that would, that, that would make my job much easier. <laughs> um, so, so we're interested in tracking and paying. And then I think the other thing that it's not a policy prescription, but 
one thing that we're always interested in is in increasing transparency around copyright. So when we do generate a claim, we're clear to the user who's claiming their work, what their options are under the law, and what their options are on the site. And so the more transparent we can be, the more we know about who owns embedded compositions, the more we're able to do, the more revenue we're able to generate. And so anything that increases that sort of transparency is, is good for artists and good for platforms like YouTube. Can I just ask one quick thing? Sure. Why don't you set aside a tiny percentage into a fund for healthcare for artists? Because I think that would do a lot more than copyright would ever do to increase creativity. So that's a great suggestion. Again, we're licensing content, right? And so when we're paying artists and we're paying thousands of artists on the site, um, you know, we don't, we don't prescribe them. You need to spend this much on this and this much on this. Um, we're only able to contract with them around the copyright. Well, Jessica, I, say, yeah. I want to get just money, though. There's some other money around. That's what <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Jessica, I want to get you to weigh in on the policy question, sort of how, how we think about this, where the, where, the, where these decisions are getting made. Again, I know you've, your comments earlier have touched on it, but so when I look at the legislative process for uh, amending the copyright statute, um, it, it uh, inspires me to great despair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, it's very badly broken and it's in many ways most broken in music because the various rights and licenses we have are all set up around legacy intermediaries who grew up in the 20th century and for one reason or another are each protecting their slice of pie even if the money is all supposed to flow to some of the same people. I wish there were a way to sort of blow that up uh, and start again with something that allows one-stop shopping that focuses on getting money to creators and not so much on, on control. I don't think that Congress is in a position to give us that, and unfortunately, I don't think that voluntary negotiations uh, among big behemoths is in, the, is in a position to give us that either. Uh, so that I, my sort of policy recommendation is we need to figure out the world we want to live in and live as if the law made that possible and hope that Congress and business get together and follow along. Uh, but that's a, a risky kind of prescription um, that for some kind of law reform, so. Dean, I want to get your thoughts. You've seen, I mean, you've seen this, like Jessica, you've seen this process, you've observed the process for, you know, 50 the, years at least. 50 years at least. <laughs> well, but at least the last, the Not very, the very let's, let's just say you've seen it at least since the 90s when things got real interesting right. in copyright, right? So you, and you've seen it from multiple perspectives, as you said. So Actually, just building on what Professor Linton said is my experience is that technology is always racing far ahead by an exponential rate while the legal system is always lagging behind exponentially as well. And so the system that we have, which is the law setting general parameters, but us figuring it out through the courts and through negotiation is probably as good as we're gonna get. I don't know if that's a encouraging or a depressing <laughs> statement, but it may just be a very real statement. I, I, it's hard for me to contemplate constructing a system that will get at something that's more perfect. Great, well let's take questions. Adam, you're our man. <laughs> I like your socks, by the way. Very nice. When you show everyone your socks. <laughs> uh, my name is Steve Korn from BFM Digital. I'm one of the 100 people who are 100 companies making six figures of YouTube income. And I represent about 500 labels. Um, I guess it's a question for Chris, but it's also partially a statement to a response to Larissa, which is YouTube is now becoming the third or fourth best revenue source for most of my indie labels. And it's augmenting 
uh, uh, declining CD sales, declining mechanicals, declining sync even in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm hearing here is all of, I know we're in the US and we're talking about US copyright law, but uh, most of my indie artists are, are taking advantage of the global outreach of the digital world. Dean, I totally agree with your, your point there, that it's never been easier to distribute all around the world. But YouTube's ad revenue program is like 95% US generated. And you know, for me, I don't even know if it's, actually, I honestly don't even know if I see any UK revenue, but there's a big opportunity out there of having artists. And I'm wondering what the, the, what the, the policy is for expanding the ad share program and uh, throughout Europe would be a good start. Yeah, so um, what you're seeing isn't typical of what we see in aggregate on the site, so it could be that your catalog is US focused. The US ad market for online advertising is more mature than what exists in Europe and certainly much more uh, mature than what's in Asia as well. And so we've sort of been um, taking steps there over time and we'll take more in the next, before the year ends to, to make serious headway in those other markets. Um, but yeah, I, I think that this is another thing too, just with, not with respect to YouTube specifically, but with respect to digital. I think the US has sort of led the way in platform innovation, um, although there's tons of platform innovation coming from around the world right now. But in terms of online advertising, it's also significantly ahead. So when you talk about these ad supported um, music services, you should probably be looking to the US as a bellwether, although the, um, <laughs> the dual copyright setup in the US especially makes it much harder to monetize some of that content. So um, the fact that you're seeing the majority of your revenues come from the US where the complexities are even more than they are in a lot of European countries with single collecting societies, it should be a, a hopeful sign. Can I, can I jump in? Sure, well, yeah, please. Um, uh, first, I want to take advantage to do something that I never get to do, which is awesome. My name is pronounced Larissa, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I think the question of international um, uh, uh, participants is really important because also copyright law, although it's a global system, uh, assumes a particular kind of creativity, which is based in a particular set of cultures around uh, art. Um, and so when you go globally, there's a lot of creative practices that mean that people are going to have a very hard time uh, defining themselves properly as an author. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so they are not going to get this money. You also already have this problem of plenty of people who, by any definition, are authors, but don't have the power to negotiate the ownership of their copyright and thus not getting money. And that also is exacerbated outside of the US and especially in the global south. My research is on Jamaica. Uh, I lived there for a year, and um, that's a lot of what I was focusing on. Uh, and so that's, again, I think, I think that's a real concern that I don't, I don't think the system can be expanded as is, and just people are just going to be able to participate because Jamaicans who make music like Jamaicans can't participate. They have to make music like non-Jamaicans in order to participate. I'm, I'm making a character a little bit, but not that much. Like, there's a whole bunch of artists who will never be able to participate on their own terms as artists uh, unless they abandon the cultures and the traditions that they are part of. Uh, so that's, I think, a really interesting, uh, interesting point. Next question, please. Well, that I was just, great, oh, by the way. Sorry. Thank you for the yeah. question. Um, I have another question for YouTube. Um, it, I was wondering if YouTube is doing anything to track live performances because I've seen a lot of videos um, that have upwards 12, 20 million views um, where it's very clear who the performers are. I mean, you can see it visually. Um, say it's a micro, Michael Brecker performance and you... Uh, you know what, what the song is, but there's not a fingerprint in the sense that there's a master um, because it's, a say, a television performance that was on an obscure channel um, in Italy. Yeah. And so I was wondering, is there any kind of compensation happening on the songwriter side or even performer side? Yeah, so we do, it's possible for anybody who's in a, any publisher, that owns the composition rights in a live performance to claim content on the site and monetize it. So to the extent that they identify it, it's possible to claim it and make money from it. Similarly, if somebody owned that sound recording, they could also claim it. It happens less frequently than it does on the commercial sound recording side because the, the means for identification are, are much, they exist at scale on the sound recording side. But yeah, we, it's definitely possible to claim and monetize that content. And we do have 
publishers making lots of claims against both live uh, professional performances and then also user covers of songs on the site, which is a new revenue stream sort of built around fan interaction. Hi, um, this is a question for Chris also um, about content ID and could you talk a little bit about I can't see oh, you. Back. Your oh. words matter more. Okay, all right, okay. Hi. Um, about the percentage of notice and takedown that's effective, um, and just more about that. So, what was the question on effectiveness? Uh, the notice and takedown, like how, how do you have a number or um, what percentage of videos that are taken down effectively pop back up and that sort of thing? Oh, I see, yeah. So we have, um, the vast majority, it's worth saying at the beginning that the, the vast, vast majority of videos that are identified are kept on the site and monetized it today. Um, videos that are taken down, if they're taken down automatically by our system, the user gets a notice where, um, because at that, at that point they can say, if it's been taken down automatically by Content ID, there's been an error in the system. No system's perfect. The precision on Content ID is effectively perfect, it, um, but it, it's not perfect, so they can, um, dispute the, the accuracy of the claim. Oftentimes, too, people will send us the wrong metadata on a sound recording file, and so there's some confusion there, and they have the ability to dispute that. The user can also dispute the claim and say, no, I actually have the rights to use this under fair use, or I've licensed this already, which is actually also something that's common when we're putting television commercial content on the site as well, where the the uploader has gone out and cleared the sync and sound recording. Then at that point, I'm sorry, this is a really long answer. At that point, the user can, can make, or the user can accept the claim as is. If they dispute the claim, it goes back to the content owner, and then the, um, the content owner can choose to make a DMCA, a claim under the DMCA or not, and then all of the flows from that point forward follow the DMCA law. Um, and I don't have percentages on what number come back up, but uh, I don't. I don't have those numbers. Oh hi, um, my name is Bill Rosenblatt from Giant Steps Media Technology Strategies. Um, I'm a consultant, and I'm I'm having some trouble with Omid's value proposition here. Um, I've, you're basically running a business for redistributors of content to make it easy for them to do the right thing. And I've seen this in the text content space. It doesn't have a good track record. What, what are you really offering the remix artists besides make it easy to do the right thing? You know, what, what is their incentive to participate in this? Well, uh, the, the ability to monetize their work is, is one incentive. Uh, but it's interesting when you, like... Why would they monetize it otherwise? Well, they can't. So, so let, let's, let's fill, we should fill in one thing. Yeah. So to participate in the commercial record industry, um, to be on iTunes or to be on eMusic, um, you need to have everything licensed. Everything needs to be cleared. Uh, so you won't find Girl Talk on iTunes, for instance, because the samples on his record are not cleared, even though he has an argument that they fall into a defense to copyright. They, they're not cleared, and that's not an acceptable argument to the intermediaries. So if you want to participate in, the, in all of the structures of the commercial music industry, you need your stuff to be cleared. And I think that's what Amit's referring to. Uh, there's a book I can recommend to you. It's great I get to plug this. I wrote a book called Creative License with uh, Kembrew McLeod from the University of Iowa, and we explain you know, the legalities of that. Is, is what I'm, I mean, what you say is, I'm not disagreeing with what you say, but what I, what I disagree with is that there's no way to monetize your content unless you're on iTunes or eMusic. There are oh, plenty of ways fair. to monetize content but, besides being on iTunes and email. That's fair, but the point of an incentive is that there's more you can monetize, I think is what I mean saying, right? Like, yeah, you can, do, you can li perform live as a DJ, but there are structures that are not available to you. So that, but, that but is But I would disagree that uh, iTunes and, uh, and Amazon are the sole uh, vehicle for the sale of music. A lot of uh, these DJs promote themselves heavily on Facebook. Uh, their shows is a, a way of promotion. So at each point of contact, like what's really interesting right now the stuff that people are enjoying in the clubs or in the concert just can't be purchased. So it's all, it's all uh, remixes. The stuff that people really are interested in 
is not the, the generic stuff on iTunes, it's the stuff that's been remixed. And there's a disconnect that you hear something really awesome in the, in the club or in a performance, there's no click to buy option. And uh, we're not saying that everyone's gonna buy it, but it's, we wanna put remixers on par with original artists that they can also monetize uh, their work, and uh, as simple as that. Um, everyone's kind of been talking around a compulsory licensing scheme a little bit, and I'm just curious to know whether you think, regardless of whether or not Congress could actually get it done, whether you think it would be good or bad for the industry, both artists, labels, um, those of us that like to buy music that would like to pay for Girl Talk if possible. Um, so I just was wondering whether you think that's even a viable option. Jessica, go ahead if you want to jump well, in. So if we uh, put to one side the question whether Congress is likely to enact it, all right, the devil's going to be in the details. I mean, I think going forward there are two things that might make sense. One of them is a statutory license. The other is to follow the Copyright Office's recommendation and just get rid of all of the compulsory licenses, every single one, um, because that would at least enable us to sort of start new and try and figure out what licenses we all need rather than having the licenses out there distort the kind of stuff we can buy, the stuff we can listen to, and so forth. I think either of those solutions would probably be better than the situation we find ourselves in now. But um, uh, that's, I, I can be accused, I think, of, of sort of grass is greener optimism based on not knowing the details of what that world would look like. I think um, I don't have a, a firm opinion on what the, the business outcome or the artist compensation outcome would be, if it would be better or worse under a compulsory license. I do know for the, the, the vast majority of people who create content today who are not musicians and not copyright lawyers, the idea that there was something that would enable them to be creative and it would be a guarantee would be nice to have. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, although again, I would say, I would like there to be some kind of de minimis or some, like, some cutout so that it's not compulsory for every possible use everywhere all the time that has to be monitored and reported on. Like, there should be still some places where people just mess around and money is not actually exchanged because I think that brings in a set of other concerns that sometimes isn't useful, um, you know, and I, so I think, and uh, the idea that it would be compulsory uh, when you have a ringtone, when you're whistling in the shower and the microphone on your computer picks it up. I mean, you know, I mean, because that's the thing now, you know, these networks, it's more and more possible to monitor every possible use there ever is. And I don't think that's only value added. So I would still want some kind of carve. We'd have to actually define, like, is singing in the shower ever going to be monetizable? Is that like a win for everyone? So. All right, we have time for at least one more. Uh, Hi. Yeah, I was hoping that um, Chris and then Larissa also could comment on sort of how fair use plays into the system. Um, you know, if it's an affirmative defense, then the content owners automatically have, you know, you're taking it down as soon as they file a request. And it just seems like that is perhaps unfair. <laughs> um, and in terms of having an open space to play, it seems like that's what fair use is supposed to be, but it doesn't really get asserted until maybe it's too late for a lot of people that can't afford litigation or afford to be in the federal court system. Yeah. Um, I don't have, a, so basically our position is that we're letting the people who own the copyright and the people using the work negotiate that fair use. And that's not a clean space. And I think to everything that this panel has spoken about, there's definitely power dynamics at play, and I recognize that. But as a platform, that's the, that's the way that we're operating today. Yeah, yeah I, I want to hear from Jessica, too, I think, on this. But the, one, the thing I would say is, I mean, yeah, it, it's not a fair system of negotiation. That isn't necessarily like YouTube's fault. But also, I think any business, any platform which is a business, uh, is beholden to things like the DMCA. Any platform that gets big enough to be noticed has to act like a business. It is a business. So you need an organization that is about communities and artists and creativity. You need artists to organize. You need all of that because those concerns will never be represented. I mean, there's over and over again, there's this sort of shock and horror as SoundCloud starts taking down DJ mixes and going, you know, 
heavens, there's, there's copyright violation happening on SoundCloud when they invited DJs to participate and got all of our data and took our money and beta tested on us and then got big enough right, <laughs> that, that they became uh, beholden to these same rules. Right? And that's just going to happen. So expecting businesses to solve that problem will never work because it's not ever been their job. Um, but that said, uh, and, that, and so for fair use, I think even that is not going to be enough because fair use used to exist alongside a whole world of un unmonitored behavior. Right? It used to be the cherry on top of all the things that we just did all the time. We made mixtapes on our cassettes <laughs> and gave them to each other and nobody could see. You know? So it's not enough to look at fair use as if that's going to cover all those things that were just assumed to be allowed before. We're going to actually have to um, look at what those things were and how they mattered to our culture and to the various cultures and societies involved and figure out you know, how to protect those things. Did you want to I'd endorse that. <laughs> all right. Well, I think uh, that's all the time we have. Let's thank our panel for a wonderful discussion. Thank you.